Um, it is uh, the absolute honor of Encyclopedia Virginia, a project of Virginia Humanities to uh, introduce the uh, keynote conversation, which uh, features uh, uh, two award-winning teachers, educators. Uh, Chris Matthews is a fourth grade teacher from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and he will be in conversation with uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. And the last time we did this was uh, last fall in Williamsburg at the Virginia Council of Social Studies uh, Conference. It was so popular that we're, we're doing it again. I'm so grateful that uh, both of these uh, amazing people can, can join us. Um, I gave too long of an introduction last time. Suffice it to say that both of these guys are uh, well recognized in their field. Um, and uh, I think I took up too much time. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn uh, the program over to Chris, who has some questions lined up for Dr. Jeffrey. So, uh, so glad uh, that we we're able to do this. Guys, why don't you uh, take it away? Awesome, Peter, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate all the work that you're doing and all the work that Encyclopedia Virginia has been involved in doing. And I just wanna say a big thank you to our hosts today too. It's really, really awesome to have another venue to have this conversation. Um, Hassan, Dr. Jeffries, last time that we that we got to talk together, it seemed like we were we were in that that era where a lot of these topics were still kind of discussed in somewhat hushed tones, unless you were in a group of the uh, initiated, so to speak. Um, but now it feels like a lot of this has really bubbled to the surface, and it's a lot more um, significant and relevant of a national conversation that's going on now. So. I look forward to, to revisiting some of the topics that we looked at last time, but got some updates for us this time as well. So Dr. Jeffries, um, for those who may be unfamiliar, uh, talk to us a little bit about your work with the Southern Poverty Law Center um, and teaching, uh, teaching hard history, teaching tolerance. I know that was my big first introduction to you was from listening to the podcast, and I've been a long time listener of the podcast. So talk to us a little bit about this work that you're doing and how you came into this work. It will certainly. And, and Chris, it's great to be uh, in conversation again. Uh, Peter, thank you for extending the invitation initially and extending it again and helping to organize this, of course, uh, State Library. Uh, it, 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 this is, it is, it, it seems like uh, the last time we were together was, was barely six months ago or so. Uh, it seems like a lifetime. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, things have changed, not just a little, but a lot. And those hushed conversations are now being held. Uh, in open quarters, in public spaces, uh, where they need to be held. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of that uh, and, and to dialogue again under these circumstances and conditions as well. So, so the, the question, teaching hard, teaching hard history in the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, teaching tolerance. Um, I, I chair the advisory committee uh, for teaching tolerances, teaching hard history project. Uh, and it has been, a project's been going on uh, for almost four years now. And uh, it initially, it, it sort of has, has evolved over time. Um, it, the, the original um, first couple of years was focused heavily on um, how to teach American slavery accurately and effectively. Um, you can go to the Teaching Tolerance website uh, and there you will find the Teaching Hard History Framework, uh, which offers not just sort of 10 key points points of reference, points of entry to teaching the history of American slavery uh, accurately and effectively. But more, most importantly, I think, or equally important, uh, it offers resources, uh, primary source resources uh, for all of these uh, key points, videos, short videos, summary videos that can be used in the classroom, but most importantly, can be used by educators to bring them up to speed on the importance and relevance of these key points by major uh, historians, uh, uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, Ibram Kendi. I mean, so it's really a fantastic resource there. And, and we didn't, what we didn't do, what you won't find there uh, are, are, are lesson plans per se. But what you will find are resources, uh, primary resources that you can use to supplement uh, your material and your approach in the classroom. We're, we're well aware that, uh, you know, we have 50 states and, and 50 different standards for instruction and, and so we purposefully didn't do the lesson plan approach. Uh, we went with uh, big ideas, big concepts, how we can drill down on them, how you can drill down on them 
in the classroom and then resources to supplement that work. Uh, initially, we focused very heavily on uh, upper, well, really high school, uh, but last year we extended the framework um, so that the emphasis is on elementary and middle school. One of our key uh, approaches or philosophical approaches uh, to teaching American slavery um, is that we have to scaffold it, that it is insufficient uh, to just look at drop in uh, on, in the eighth grade uh, as we do in Ohio uh, or come back uh, for a few minutes in uh, the 12th and 11th grade, that you have to be introducing these concepts of power, of privilege, of racism, of white supremacy in age appropriate ways, uh, but really at the earliest ages and then build on them just as we would do with mathematics, just as we do with language. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't do that with social studies and we certainly don't do that with these elements we call hard history, the stuff that we are most uncomfortable about uh, in the past. So that's, that's, and in addition, as you pointed out, uh, I forgot one of the things that I do, uh, is, host a, is host a podcast. Right. And so we did a, uh, we, we, we have been doing, we, we just wrapped up our second season, the first season, is rooted very much in sort of um, the enslavement of African Americans. Second season, also about 12, 15 episodes each, um, looks at enslavement of African Americans, but puts it into the context of the broader history of the of the slavery in America. So looking at the enslavement of indigenous people, native peoples as well. We're coming up, we just started recording um, the third season, which is beginning to connect the dots. So the third season is actually gonna be about uh, civil rights and the civil rights movement. Uh, because one of the things that we uh, talk about in the framework is we have to deal with legacies. And that's one of the things we're, we're wrestling with right now, Chris, as a nation, right? What in Virginia, for sure. What are the legacies of slavery? How do we, how have we memorialized? How have we celebrated? How have we commemorated? What have we gotten right? And what have we gotten wrong? And so this third season is focusing on uh, the civil rights era, civil rights movement, but very much connecting the dots and placing an emphasis on the primary legacy of the institution of slavery, which is white supremacy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for everyone who's listening, um, I can't, I think someone might've dropped it into the chat, but there is a link there to the podcast. And I have to say, um, I've been teaching fourth grade for about six years now. And um, the podcast has, has been of immeasurable value to me just in terms of providing that background knowledge. Because I know, especially for many of us who are in the primary grades, you know, we, we go to school, we might specialize in a certain area of history, but for a lot of us, we're getting a very general and broad education on how to teach within all of these various disciplines, right? So we might not be at the high school or even the collegiate level where we're focusing in not only just on history, but on one specific era of history and going really deep into the, the, the complexities and the nuances there. So a lot of times I think what teachers are struggling with is just our own personal background knowledge. What do we know? What do we understand about these historical concepts? And we call it hard history. And I, I think that's such an accurate term, not just because of the fact that they're, con they're concepts and, and topics that make us uncomfortable, but because we've received a lot of misinformation, a lot of distortions, um, and sometimes no information at all on some of these topics. And I think what, what, what I've had the tendency to do in the classroom a lot of times is I might get a question or there may be something that we're, we're really investigating. And unfortunately, sometimes I've filled in the blanks. I've made inferences in places where I really shouldn't have been inferring. I should have been investigating. I should have been modeling that process of really problem solving and looking at, okay, you know what? That's a really difficult question. Probably has a really difficult answer that I can't just make up off the top of my head. So the, the way that this podcast is able to break down these incredibly immense topics and make them accessible for educators, I think is a real value. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Uh, uh, I certainly appreciate it. No, absolutely. And, and if I could just really highlight and underscore um, what you just said in terms of approach uh, in the classroom, and even with the fourth graders, with the littles as I call them, and I got a couple upstairs right now, that you know we're so conditioned, I think, as instructors and teachers and parents to, uh, to be right all the time. Right, that we have that when we approach something uh, like this, not only difficult and hard in terms of its content to sort of think about and talk about, but also how to convey that if we don't have the answers, then we just sort of shy away, right? And we don't want to mislead, uh, but so then we just don't engage. But this, we have to see this as an opportunity 
especially for the younger kids, right, who aren't uncomfortable with this, right? They are, they're, they're not uncomfortable with this stuff at all. They only pick up on our, our discomfort, right? But, but children, especially at the younger age, they have a natural, uh, they're naturally inquisitive and they just want to know. And so we can play to that um, and, and build on that strength by saying, you know, just as you said, you know, that, that's a difficult question. I bet it has a difficult answer, but we can figure it out together. And, and that's, I think, the approach that we need, right? Not to shy away from it, but to lean into it. And as we lean into it, lean into it with the kids uh, and let them be a part of uh, the investigation uh, following their own inquiry. I, I think that's absolutely the way to go. Yeah, abs absolutely, absolutely. And, and I know one thing that we run into a lot of times in the classroom is, um, particularly in the primary grades, but I'm, I'm seeing and hearing a lot more about this in, in upper grades as well. But social studies as a discipline, social sciences as a discipline, does tend to get crowded and pushed to the margins um, uh, to the deference of, of language arts development, uh, mathematics, science. And we see, you know, the ways in which the, the nation over the last few decades has really put in this major effort to try to systematically break down these topics. But a lot of times what ends up happening is it crowds out the space and the time for social studies instruction. And we're often in the classroom, we're, we're met with the challenge of having to defend, well, why is it important for us to even spend this much time on this? Um, and so I wonder if you could, if you could speak to that a little bit, just regarding our need for a deeper understanding of slavery, of, of, of racial politics, of, um, of black history in general, what is, what is at stake, not just for our, our society as a whole, but before our students, our, our students who are black, our students who are indigenous, our students who are otherwise people of color, um, but also for our white students, what's at stake for us? Why does this matter? Well, that's, that's a great question. And it has, it, there's, a, there's a lot of um, elements and aspects to it. Um, I, I'll begin, I think, first by th thinking about how we as a nation approach education. And you're absolutely right. Certainly for the last two decades, for the last 20 years, there has been a heavier emphasis on the STEM, science and technology, uh, especially K through 12, which is totally fine, right? I mean, we, 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 this is, we live in a knowledge economy. We live in a technological economy. Uh, we all have to be proficient in that. But as you pointed out, what has suffered as a result is we have pushed the humanities to the margins. We've been squeezed at the edges. So, so what has been the result of that? Now you have you know, technologically proficient people who don't understand the world in which they live. Uh, and that is a recipe for societal disaster because we're not actually preparing people to understand uh, the humanistic issues that we face as a society. Uh, in a couple, I, I've been in conversation, uh, I'm here in Columbus, Ohio, and down the road down in Dayton is a major Air Force base, uh, Wright-Patterson, and at Wright-Patterson, they have a, um, uh, the Air Force's sort of Institute of Technology, it basically uh, is sort of a, a, you know, a master's PhD uh, program, a mini university right there. Uh, so filled with brilliant minds, right? Brilliant uh, engineers and, and scientists and the like, uh, and I was talking to them, and, and, and they were like, yeah, well, so the Air Force, just like everybody else, is sort of wrestling with these issues now of sort of race and systemic racism and, and injustice. And, and I was like, well, tell me about the general education, right? He's like, all right, well, we hit, you know, we hit college and everybody's in engineering classes. And I know I see that Ohio State, they're not getting any serious engagement in the humanities. So we're relying on K through 12. And if we're being squeezed there for 20 years, they're not getting anything of real use and value to help people understand the world in which we live today. And that's so critical. And this is where the social studies become so important because we have to not only make sense of, the way to make sense of the world today is to understand where we have come from. And, and you know, with children in particular, right, as educators, like it is our job to help, to help them understand, to help them know, but help them understand. The only way they can understand the present in order to prepare them for addressing the issues of tomorrow is, is if they understand where we've come from. And that's why we got to do these deep dives in history. And because we have been, and, and this also shouldn't be, I think social studies should certainly be the center of that. But when it comes to these difficult subjects, just as we have to scaffold, just as we have to think vertically we, and teach vertically, 
we also have to teach horizontally. We have to teach across the curriculum. So just as we're being squeezed in, in how much time and energy we can put directly into social studies, that doesn't mean that in language arts, in foreign language, in math and science, that we also don't take up these same issues, right? I mean, in, in art, for example, or even in mathematics, we're dealing right now, uh, it, I'll come back to that in a second, but right now, of course, we're dealing with these questions of monuments. Y'all in Virginia know a little bit about that. This question of monuments, how do we commemorate? Well, you certainly could use in a math class, a science class, an art and design class, uh, examples of, of how do we commemorate and what would a commemoration look like? And if you were going to design something, what would that look like? I mean, so there's ways to connect uh, if you were going to build in Richmond a new monument boulevard, right? Like, how would you design that? I mean, so there are ways to connect the sciences uh, to the humanities that reinforce and offer students uh, a deeper dive into this material. So we need to be thinking about, we think about sort of this history and, and social science, social studies being the uh, a point of entry, and it is a point of entry, and it should be the major point of entry, the principal point of entry, but it doesn't have to be the only point of entry. Right? We have to think about how we can come at it from different angles that reinforce what we're doing in social studies. Uh, it shouldn't just be up to us, but we do have to set the agenda, I think, uh, and, and explain to others what we need them to do uh, so that our students get the fullest education possible. Yeah, and and you know, I, I I was thinking thinking too, just as you were writing, how how as you were speaking, how important that is that we take this this kind of multidisciplinary approach, and and um, and we'll come we'll circle back around to that in a little while, I think, if we have some time. But um, I think that's going to be especially important going into this school year, where we're seeing a lot of people uh, are looking at going and starting out the year virtually. And so there is going to be even more, I think, uh, of a crunch and, and a push to, to maximize time, to minimize the time that the students have to be on screen and, 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 and you know, give them a little bit more autonomous work to do um, and tasks to accomplish. And I think that's gonna make it even more important that we find ways to, as you said, set the agenda and, and make sure that we are sharing these resources, sharing methods of getting this into some of the other disciplines. Um, Dr. Jeffries, the, the killings of, of our brother Ahmaud Arbery and Sister Breonna Taylor and uh, brother George Floyd um, seem to, to be a, a real tipping point for the, the, the greater American consciousness when it comes to um, police brutality, uh, racism, and just the, the state of the union at large. Um, so educators all across the nation at this point are, are really starting to look inward in a way that I, I just haven't quite seen before um, in my time as an educator, I'll say. And there have been, I know there are conversations that I've had in, in my school buildings, in, in my grade level meetings, in my, you know, building leadership team meetings that, you know, I might be the one to bring it up and it's, oh, you know, that's, that's radical Matthews over there. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's black power over there. But now this is becoming something that educators everywhere are really looking at, okay, this is something that is urgent and it's vital. Um, so in terms of that, where, where do uh, educators need to begin in terms of not only looking at their interactions with students and, and the way that they do instruction, but even just what we, what we realize and how we can unearth our own in, inner biases, our own misunderstandings. Where do we begin with, with retraining, unlearning, and deconstructing some of this? Well, I think, I think two things. One, there is the personal, but then there's also the sort of the, the, the classroom. And I'll circle back to the personal because we can always pick that up. Well, actually, let me, let me start there. I think on, on the personal side, as instructors, as teachers, uh, we, we, have to, we have to do some soul searching and digging. Um, but then we also have to be willing to open ourselves up to our students. We have to be willing to share more than perhaps we have in the past especially because now we're talking about race. And so we, we have to, as um, teachers who are white, like I, I don't have this problem when I go into a classroom at Ohio State and I, I walk into a US history survey and there's 200 students there. And because Ohio State is almost 85% white, you know, there'll be five black students. Like there is no mystery when I walk in that I ain't white, right? I, I don't have to declare my race walking in the door. The students already understand that but we have normalized whiteness. And so as, as in the classroom, it is vitally important that if you're gonna have a conversation about these subjects, which revolve centrally around race, 
right? We haven't got to racism. We're talking about race. That you have to, the way you give your students permission to talk about this openly, because everything that we've that we that's projected at them is like this is a third rail. This is a topic that we don't touch. This is something that makes us uncomfortable. We talk about it in hushed tones, right? Is is to begin to acknowledge your own identity in this society, right? Particularly as it revolves around race. You'll be amazed at the, at the permission that then gives to students to talk openly and honestly about this thing called race, right? To walk in. And I, I, I've, I've been asking teachers to do this and, and they've done it and they've come back. They're like, especially white teachers in particular. And they've said, you know, I was nervous. I wasn't sure, you know, I, I was going to do it, but I wasn't sure how I was going to go. And then they say literally, you know, good morning. My name is so-and-so and I'm white. And the students are like, huh, I guess no one's ever said that before, right? But then there's this sort of this moment of like, okay, like, all right, I get it. Kids get it. But then it, it allows more space for honest conversation. It's like, okay, what does that mean? And what is my heritage and what is my ancestor? So on the personal side, I think bringing that in, because what we're seeing in the streets isn't just philosophical or theoretical, it's personal. We're talking about people's lives and lives being lost and lives being damaged. And so it's okay to be personal, I think, uh, in how we teach because it's giving our students permission uh, to look inside them as well. But that's, that's the personal. But when we hit that classroom, I think before we touch upon anything else, and I would love to see this in the youngest grades, but you know, knowing that uh, you know, our students have varied, uh, you know, varied encounters with questions of race and racism, feel free to be comfortable in the knowledge that they haven't had these conversations, is that somebody, at the beginning of class, you tell, explains to these students, young people, even the youngs, that race isn't real. That race biologically is, is meaningless. Although socially, it is meaningful. In other words, because you know, there's nothing fundamentally different between our DNA, uh, between uh, anybody who was on this, in this Zoom right now, we're essentially all the same. Biologically, race is meaningless. But socially, it is constructed and it's meaningful because it has created the hierarchy uh, in our society. And so those two things have to be explained to our students while at the same time, and again, this is like, this is the first day. At the same time, uh, we have to say that, that race is also culturally relevant, right? Because we use race in American society as a stand-in for cultural ancestry, for, for cultural heritage and ancestry. It's what we inherit. That's why we can't be colorblind. Like that's critically important. It's biologically meaningless. So if it's meaningless, we shouldn't deal with it. Well, yeah, in theory, the problem is that we have this hierarchy. So we got to understand it in historical context and in the contemporary moment. But that also means because it, we use it as a stand-in for culture and a stand-in for ancestry that we can't just ignore it. And that's part of what the moment that we're living in. Like, look, you got to stop ignoring this. Not, not only ignoring the problems, but also ignoring the people. Because if, if you approach me uh, and say, hey, and, I, and I, I, I've gotten on a plane when I used to get on planes, and I used to get on planes a lot, and somebody, you know, you, you, you sit down quietly, I'm minding my business, Brother Matthews, and, you know, a nice white lady gets on and sits next to me, and then we, stay, you know, she starts talking. I'm just trying to have my little sip of Coca-Cola and look out the window. But she starts talking, it's like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, I teach African-American history. It's like, oh, I got a black friend. And by the way, I'm colorblind. It's like, all right, I ain't asked all that, right? <laughs> so, but, but what is she saying, right? In that, but this colorblindness is like, you're actually saying that you don't see me, right? Like, I don't see race. Well, then yes, you do. Because we know that children at literally as young as babies, as young as three and four months old are able to distinguish people by race because of the signals and cues they're picking up from their parents and caregivers. So this colorblind thing is really just something that we create in our minds not to have to deal with the problems in our society. We, we, we see color, we see race. There's nothing wrong with that because we use it as a substitute for cultural heritage and ancestry. We just don't want people to discriminate on the basis of race. Like that's the distinction. But coming in, this is what our students need to understand. And it is liberatory, right? Like we've gone through school and we've heard in college, well, race is a social construction. Like, all right. So we get that in our mind. No one's ever told that to our kids. And so when you go in and you have, because I, I speak to, you know, when I talk to schools and I tell this to kids, the kids then go home and tell their parents, it's like, mom, did you know race isn't real? And they're like, wow, like no one ever, 
So you never thought to think, to, you never thought to sit down like, look, this thing is just a fabrication of our imagination. It's fantasy, but it has real world, real world consequences. But the power of that is profound because now it gets students questioning, right? Well, why then do we have these hierarchies? Why then do certain groups suffer if race isn't real? So then they want to know. Then, they, then, we have to, then we have to begin to unpack and to explain. And the best learning, I think, uh, is when, teach, when students want to learn, right? When students are trying to figure things out. And that's, that doesn't matter if you're in the first grade, fourth grade, high school, or college. And, then, and that's the point, I think, where we are now. Because our kids are going to come in, right? And, and after seeing what's been going on this summer, and this is why it's so fundamentally different than what we have seen in the past, is they want to know. So it's not even, like, you're not even going to have a choice in this matter, right? Because you're either going to deal with these issues in your classes, or if you don't, you're going to have to deal with the students who are going to be talking about you not dealing with it, right? So, so you can decide for yourself. And I'd rather be on the side of being that teacher uh, who, in, who those students when they come to uh, Ohio State, uh, and I get kids from Virginia and everywhere, when they come to Ohio State, they tell me about the class that they had with you that, that dealt with these issues. Uh, because when I get them and they haven't had that class with you, and we begin to talk about this material, and we begin to talk about slavery and Jefferson and the Constitution and how racism is infused in American society and coded in our DNA, they start going through those uh, five stages of guilt, right, or, of grief, right? They're like disbelief, then they're mad and upset. But, but then at that point where they get mad, like they don't get mad at me. Like they get mad at you looking back, right? It's like, well, my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Matthews, he never explained this to me, right? And so now they're all upset with you. That's not what we want. We want them, I want them, so I can build on what they have learned to be looking back and like, I remember that class, because that sets the stage for everything. That helps them understand absolutely everything. And I think this is, as, as, as troubling a moment as we are living in, it's also an opportunity, because our kids are trying to figure this out, and they have questions. And the questions may be framed a little funny, they might not, they not, might not be able to articulate exactly what it is that they're trying to figure out, but they, but they understand that something is fundamentally different that something is in the air uh, that they are breathing and they're trying to make sense of it. And I think it is our job, it is our duty, it is our challenge, it is our purpose to help them make sense of, uh, uh, of this particular moment. Wow, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I think um, one thing as we, as we continue moving forward with this and seeing how, how educators are going to continue to engage with this, um, we, we are going to see not just in terms of the practical challenges of time um, and, and, and space with us having to teach in these virtual spaces now, but also I think we're going to be up against an ideological battle as well that has been, been waged um, within, within these spaces before. But um, some things kind of struck me as particularly urgent recently, some comments that were made uh, recently, Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas, some of you may know. Um, made some comments regarding the 1619 project being taught in schools. Um, he, he went on to say that the, the, the curriculum was a racially divisive and revisionist account of history that denies the, uh, quote, noble principles of freedom and equality on which our nation was built. Just a little while before that, um, the President of the United States was making some similar comments said that there's a new far left fascism that wants to indoctrinate our students and quote wipe out our history defame our heroes and erase our values so uh, whether these things materialize into policy or not kind of remains to be seen but uh, we know that that power certainly exists but either way these are these are ideological pieces of rhetoric that are going to be out there out there and and they've been out there before but now they're being articulated on the national stage um, and so I wonder what, what's our best line of defense against that particular rhetorical attack, um, not only against teachers, but specifically against this, this idea of looking at hard history. Yeah. Well, I, I think first it's important to recognize that this is a defensive posture, right? And when we think about, um, Senator Cotton and, you know, Trump is Trump, but it's a defensive, they're defending 
what actually already exists. They're defending a version of uh, the American past, the American story, the American journey that is rife with myths and misconceptions. Uh, that, is, that, that itself is inherently political uh, because it serves a political purpose to perpetuate a vision uh, of the American past that is, that is rooted in this notion of American exceptionalism, right? Like America can do no wrong. Uh, and if it ever has a slight misstep, it always self-corrects uh, and moves forward. Well, American exceptionalism, this myth of America can do no wrong, uh, literally can cost people their lives. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and this notion of, of American superiority, America can do no wrong, uh, ha has cost America literally uh, 150,000 lives. Uh, this notion that ah, it won't happen here, that we'll get over it, somehow we can manage the crisis without ever really, the, because we're different, because we're special, is literally costing people their lives. And so if we put, if we look at the past and get rid of this idea of like America can do no wrong, we're always on the right side of history. Right? Imagine if our students, imagine if our adults now had come through and said, no, we have faced challenges, we have had opportunities, and we've blown them, and we have to take every challenge that we see seriously and not fall back on this notion of, of course, we'll always do better, the myth of perpetual progress. We might not have lost as many lives as we had. Our response uh, perhaps would have, I, I actually not perhaps, I know it would have been different. And so I think there are two things. One, this is, this is political but it's not just politics. In other words, this isn't just, we're not just, you know, the, the stakes are higher than just, than, than just politics. We're literally talking about people's lives, right? Whether it's the response to the pandemic or our response to systemic racism. So we have to deal with this history in an honest way so that we can deal with the problems that we're facing today in an effective way. I like that. We got to deal, let me say it again, we got to deal with these problems in an honest way so we can deal with the problems that we're dealing with right now in an effective way. Like that's, and that's our job. We got to connect those dots. But it, there's also a reality that we are not operating in a vacuum. And, 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 and a, we're not operating in a political vacuum, right? Now, I totally get that. I totally understand that. But that means that, and, like, and, and, you say, and, and Chris, you mentioned, well, well how, do we, how do we navigate? this terrain and territory. Well, one thing, the young people who have taken to the streets have created space for us, right? Like, like that, like we didn't create this, right? As teachers and ed educators, adults, it's the young people who have taken to the streets uh, in, 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 in response uh, to these series of public executions, public murders, who have created space for us. They're the ones uh, who have forced the issue and said no. We need to have a reckoning with our past and how we understand it and how we memorialize and remember it and teach it and talk about it. So we now have more space than we have ever had, not just in the last 12 months, than we have ever had to have a serious uh, engagement with this material in the classroom. So that's one. So we have to take advantage of it. Our students want it. Our students created it. Our students want it. And our students deserve it. One, two, you know, there's a lot of, you know, this Black Lives Matter emerged not just uh, in the past couple of months, but of course the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is connected specifically to 2013, 2014, coming out in response in part to the murder of Trayvon Martin uh, and, 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 and the, um, uh, his killer, uh, George Zimmerman, getting off, uh, uh, claiming uh, that he was, it was a matter of self-defense and that he was standing his ground. Well, we need to stand our ground as, as teachers and educators. Too often, uh, we fall victim uh, to false equivalencies in the public space, in the public square. Uh, what, what Senator Cotton is offering here, what we have had for so long with these sort of myths and misconceptions, like, no, like people saying that this is, this is the accurate uh, version of history, right? It, it, not even rooted in facts, but rooted in fantasy. And, and so we say, okay, well, we need to have an honest debate. All these sides are equal. No, they're not, right? Like the lost cause ain't real. 
right? That is a fiction. It's a fabrication and needs to be taught as such, not as this is one, this is one equally valuable uh, interpretation of the past. That ain't true. And so we have to sit and we have to be secure in our willingness to defend what is true. There is stuff that is open to interpretation, right? Which is, which is what we as historians do. And we present that, right? But whether, but we're not talking about should we debate whether or not, you know, Thomas Jefferson uh, was a good enslaver or a bad enslaver. He was an enslaver. He held people. He, he, he was raping a 14-year-old girl who he owned. There ain't nothing good about that. That's not debatable. And so when we, so we have to stake out certain ground and say, no, but we can talk about sort of, you know, his role and what it means, but some of that stuff is beyond defensible. We can't, we can't fall, we can't allow the rationalization of evil in the American past to be debated. Like that's, that, that we can't. And, and, and our, our young people have, have, are demonstrating to us that that is unacceptable. And we owe it to them. But, you know, we, we as teachers, no matter where we are, we don't take what physicians take uh, when, they, when they're sworn in, the Hippocratic Oath. But the Hippocratic Oath says, and physicians are, are sworn to this, uh, you know, one of the first things is do no harm. But as teachers, you know, that's, what we, that's our oath too, right? Our, our priority number one, in addition to educating and informing, is do no harm. And when we don't teach the truth, when we don't have, when we don't look at the American past in a serious way, and in this sense, we're talking about sort of the, the, the centrality of the institution of slavery, the centrality of racism and a deep belief in white supremacy to the American project, then we are actually doing harm. Uh, we're doing harm to the individual student. Doesn't matter if they're black or white, we're still doing harm in a different way because we're not teaching truth and we're not preparing them with what they need to make the future more democratic and better. So we have, it is going to be a challenge. I think our teachers, we're not even on the front lines of this. Our students are on the front lines. Like they are literally on the front lines. We have to back them up. They deserve that. And, and, and I, I think we got to make sure our, administra our school administrators understand that. We have to make sure our parents understand that. Now, I know there are gonna be, no matter where you are, whether you're in Virginia, across the country, here in Ohio, like there are parents, there are, you know, who are like, look, we're not having it, right? Like this is, you're trying to guilt our children, right? Our white children, you ain't worried about guilt and black children. Like we're, we're trying to guilt our white kids, right? It's like, look, some, some, there are, some explanation is gonna have to be had. Like we're gonna have to explain uh, to parents in some way, and, and, and usually in some kind of form, somebody's got to explain this to these white, these white parents who haven't had this history before, that one, ain't nobody trying to guilt your kids. No child, nobody living today is responsible for the enslavement of my, of my ancestors 150 years ago. Like, nobody's responsible for that. Nobody's trying to put that on anybody. Our children are not responsible for the chaos that we have, that, that, is, that they're experiencing today. Right, at this moment, not responsible for the past, they're not even responsible for the present, but they are responsible for what's gonna happen tomorrow. And what we have to explain to our parents is that we, in order to prepare them for tomorrow, to be, to be active citizens, engaged citizens, citizens who support democracy, diversity, inclusion, that we have to explain, you know, not only the past, but the ways in which the past has privileged some and disadvantaged others. Right, so these are, and it's, it's not an easy conversation because people have been bombarded, been swimming in these myths their entire lives. But here again is an opportunity because I'm seeing, just as you brother Matthews are seeing, like conversations that I just, that in my, in my 47 years here, have never seen before, right? And people talking about subjects like systemic racism, right? I'm like, you know, these random people, even like, I, I wish I could get on a plane now. Right, and, and see what the white lady was saying. Like, you, you want to talk about Black Lives Matter? Okay, let's go, right? We're in a different, we're in a different moment and we have to seize the moment. Uh, but we also uh, have to be, I think, just as brave and courageous as the, as the young people are who've been taken to the streets night after night after night, um, facing injury, some facing death, 
uh, in order in order to 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 right the wrongs that we have laid in their laps. Yeah, you know, Hassan, I think that's such a great point that you make, uh, particularly about how it, it really is. It's, it's the youth that's on the front lines. They are creating that space. Um, and I, I'm reminded of, of uh, what John Lewis said in, in one, of his, one of his big speeches, right, where he says that we have, we have to get in the streets, we have to stay in the streets, in every village, in every hamlet. And he says, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. Mm-hmm. And I, lo- I love that idea um, as a rhetorical device, just in the sense that it, it, it helps us to recenter the conversation and say, yeah, there, there are some really good ideas about freedom, about, about inclusion, about justice, about equality that, were, uh, that, that, were, that sprung up during this time, but they weren't complete. They were incomplete ideas. And we're still in the process of bringing that dream to fruition. Um, so I, I really appreciate your, your emphasis on that. Um, so what I'm thinking, I'm just kind of checking the time here. We're almost at about a quarter till. So I'm thinking maybe I'll ask you one more question on, uh, and then we turn over to maybe some, some questions from the chat. Does that sound okay, Emma? Sounds good. That sounds good. Beautiful. Okay. So one last question I have for you, Hassan, is um, I, I actually recently, just last week, accepted a new position as the history teacher specialist uh, for Norfolk Public Schools for elementary. Um, so I'm really, really excited. I, I'm going to have a little bit more of a hand in, in curriculum development and design training teachers, that kind of thing. So I, I'm really excited to be moving forward in this direction. Um, but I, I, it now puts me in the, in the hot seat, right? Because now I'm like, oh, now everything that I've been thinking about in terms of, of being a, a change maker in this realm, um, now I'm shouldering a little bit more of that responsibility than I, than I thought I was before. So for, for, our, for our leaders in the group, people who are on committees, people who are in leadership teams, people who are in administration even who might be a part of our group, what, what, com- what wisdom, uh, precautions, um, or, or even challenges would you issue to people who are in those decision-making seats? Mm. Well, first, congratulations. Um, that, is, that is a terrific honor, and, uh, and you're right. It is, a, um, it, is a heavy, it is a heavy bird in the shoulder. Um, but but I, think, I, I think, one, you're gonna do a fantastic job, but I think everyone who is in that position, a similar position, uh, and, and we're all kind of in positions like that in the classroom, right? I mean, we, we're, given, we're given instruction, we're given standards, we're given content, but we still make judgments and decisions. I, I, think, I think we have to be realistic about our environment. I think we have to know whether we're in a school or a district, sort of, you know, one, what is our student constituency? But then also being realistic also means, okay, what are their politics? Like, how are they approaching? Um, you know, understanding the present and the past, uh, because it is absolutely critical. And, 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 you know, we're talking about American slavery, but, you know, much of my, my work as well uh, is on civil rights and the African-American freedom struggle. And one of my, one of my heroes, one of my sheroes is Ella Baker, uh, who was a veteran organizer, uh, had roots in that, in, in Norfolk, Virginia, in fact. Uh, and, and one of her mantras uh, for organizing, for how she went into communities and organizing communities was, you start where the people are, right? You start where the people are. And I think we have to do the same thing when you're in these administrative, um, even content decision, curricular decisions, uh, curricular uh, making, uh, decision making positions. You got to start where the students are and start where the community is. And that's critical because you got to read it, right? You got to read what's going on so that you can, you can have the right point of entry. This, this isn't a function of changing content. This is a function of making sure that the content gets heard. Because if you approach it wrong, then the kids will shut you out, right? The, the, the community will shut you out, right? So you gotta figure out how do you approach it. You talk about this stuff. If, you're, if, you're in a, if you have a, a, um, a school district, a, a school or a class that is, 98% African American versus 98% white. In the end, you want them to learn the same stuff, but you got to approach that from two different angles, right? Be, be, one because of how you know what kids may already know, but then also what's going to resonate with them. And so we just have to be. We can't be blind to the realities of our social circumstances within our school, and we have to pay attention uh, to the to the classroom to the school, to the district, the community, to make very uh, strategic decisions about how to approach this. Because some, it may be that, all right, you know, I got to tackle this by talking about 
the Constitution. I got to tackle this, you know, by, by talking about sort of, you know, from that angle versus by talking about it, you know, the, 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 by, from, from the perspective of Nat Turner. Right, you walk into the suburbs of Richmond, like, ah, right, we're gonna talk about Nat Turner today. Like, ah, like, no, please, not brother Nat. Uh, but for but for young kids and black communities, like, oh yeah, let, no, tell me about you know how these folk led this revolution, right? And so you're gonna get to the same place with the persistence of resistance among African Americans, the imperfections of the of the Constitution infused with racism. But how you get there is critical, so you don't so you don't lose you don't lose people. And I'll just say this last thing as an example. Because I get so many students in my classes from uh, rural Ohio, suburban Ohio, uh, and, and who wind up not only in my African American history classes, but US history classes, it's always fun, right? Because there's certain things, you see certain themes, right? That, you know, around a third of the way through the class or whatever, you know, quietly, some kid from, from, from you know, southern, southern Ohio, which, which, is, which is really Kentucky, right, will come up and he'll say, you know, Dr. Jeffries, um, I've really been enjoying this class and, I, and I've learned a whole lot. Um, and, 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 and I, I really, you know, this isn't like, you know, my grandmother said that to be, to be careful, uh, uh of you. And I was like, really, who's your grandma? Do, do we go to college? I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I, you know, you don't know my, but she said, you know, these liberal, these liberal professors who are going to try to change your mind and this, that, and the other. Right. And so they're coming in again, like, where are you coming from? So un me understanding that going into these classrooms, knowing that first thing I tell them is I'm not here to change anybody's mind. I, I don't want you to change your mind. I just want you to open it. And if you open it, then we'll be fine. Now, you know, down the road, it may change, right? I don't tell them that, uh, but just the open mind. So understanding where they're coming from, right? Helps uh, me figure out what are gonna be my points of entry. And so in that, like, I don't come in saying, you gotta do this. I was like, look, you know, you wanna know about the Confederacy? Here are the words of the Confederates themselves. Don't take my word for it. I'm not even gonna say anything, right? Here you go. This is what they said about slavery, about slavery being a cornerstone of the confederacy right this is their words use their words and then we can do the interpretation then you can hear me once you hear them you'll be prepared you'll be pre prepared to hear me and so that's just thinking strategically about how we teach this thank you so much for sharing that with us uh with with, with me personally i know it's gonna have those are impactful words for me but i'm sure as well for many many of our leaders i mean all of us like you said this is this is not just something that people who are writing curriculum or are, are, or or are in those policy making seats this this is the this is right there in the classroom the decisions that the teachers are making right there in the classroom and and we all do need to be uh prepared for what what this is going to look like in our home communities because even even here in virginia we have a vast array of of demographics and so we do we do need to be very very prepared for how to approach that thank you so much for your time today dr jeffrey this has been an awesome conversation um, I want to see if we can get some questions in. What's what's the best way for us to do that? Should um... Um, so Ashley and I have been trying to grab them from the chat. So if you guys are comfortable with that, um, Ashley and I can ask those from the teachers in here if that works for you guys. Okay, that that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, Ashley, do you want to go ahead and ask the first one? Sure. Hi. Thank you. I am Ashley Ramey. I'm the community outreach specialist. From, for the Library of Virginia. And our first question comes from Barry Davis. As part of the time crunch we have in teaching social studies is to make sure we cover the important details, that's in quotes, details for the standardized testing students have to pass. How much has our reliance on testing contributed to the lack of focus on the hard subjects of history? Uh, thank you, thank you, Barry. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's been extremely problematic, uh, as you all know, right? that our, our obsession, not even a focus, our obsession with testing uh, has really diverted, I think, our attention away uh, from, from teaching broadly as well as teaching, teaching de deeply. One of, and we gotta figure out, you know, as long as that is still the, the dominant uh, approach to education, we have to deal with it. Hopefully, one of the things that we'll see coming out of this um, out of this uh, sort of grassroots insurgency for rethinking our education is that we begin to push away uh, from, from, from test taking and having to teach the particular test. But short of that, I mean, one of the things that I have done over my you know, 20 years of teaching, uh, 18 at Ohio State, is in, in just reflecting on my own teaching, the amount of content, the amount of information that I give students now is probably cut in half versus what I was giving uh, 20 years ago. Part of that 
is students now hold in their pockets, in their cell phones, more information than they could ever possibly uh, even access, let alone use. So the information is there. So what I've done, because I don't have to teach to a test, is I, 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 I've tried to d drill down uh, on, on, on things that they will actually remember, right? Things beyond, beyond the classroom, beyond the university. Uh, you know, and it's, it's stuff that will touch them, stuff that they will find meaningful, and that has been lasting. One of the things that I found during this, during this difficult time I have found very comforting is the number of messages and emails and text messages even that I've had from former students, some going back literally as much as 20 years when I was teaching in Alabama, who were saying, Dr. Jeffries, I remember us talking about this incident in this class or this history moment, and that has helped me understand the present moment that we're in. Right? And they're not talking about a specific fact, they're talking about something we did in a class, a conversation that we had about a particular issue. And so while we still have to, um, as long as these tests are still there, we still have to provide core content. Uh, that doesn't mean, or we have to think again strategically about how we can supplement that, even in, those, even in that material, so that they will remember it in a way that we want them to remember it beyond a particular exam. Right? You can know the details of the Constitution, but I also want you to remember that, that although this may not be a question on the state exam, that yes, the Constitution is infused with racism and for protections that reinforce an ideology and white supremacy. I guarantee you State of Virginia ain't gonna ask that question, but, uh, you can, but they need to remember that even if they don't remember um, all of the details of, of how a, a, a bill will become, become a law. So I've got another question from Joy here, and I think this is probably for both of you guys, but how important is it for schools to have agreed upon core values and PD before teaching these hard topics? Mm. Uh, Chris, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, um, my, my home school here in Norfolk, Bayview Elementary School in Norfolk, uh, we, we took this task pretty pretty seriously, in fact, just about a couple of months ago. When, uh, when the news about uh, Brother George Floyd broke, we, we had a staff meeting and our principal really was the one to lead that courageous conversation and saying that, you know, she was kind of newer to our building and she said, this is something that we, we really as a community need to look at together. Um, you know, I, I think about some of, some of these statements that we think of as cliche today, but things like, you know, a house divided cannot stand. These, these kind of statements and comments where it's, we do have to have a bit of a unified approach to some of these, to some of these topics and some of these ideas, um, that's tough because we have large, pop, large teaching populations inside of any one given school, and you won't necessarily have everybody all on the same page, coming from the same position, coming from the same set of politics, um, the same backgrounds, etc. And so, what we found was a, a route that we wanted to take in my school's community was to form a, a bit of a task force um, to start the process first of educating ourselves having that space, um, you know, we go back to some of that language from a few years ago, that safe space to talk about these things in a way that is productive and that is honest and that is meaningful. And um, it, it's been very productive so far. We actually began with, with a novel study we're reading, um, Dr. Dr. Beverly, uh, T Daniel Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Excellent text. I'm sure many of us in, in this room are probably familiar with it. Um, but we decide we, this is one thing that comes up a lot in our conversation, which is that, OK, we have our group of 10 or 15 here and we're doing this work and we want to be ambassadors for this work in our community. But what do we do to, to bring the rest of our the rest of our teaching community in um, what, what our principal and our leadership at the school has has gone ahead and decided is that they do want to go forward with moving into full all staff trainings, all, all staff opportunities to look at how can we start actually having this conversation. We're, we're learning in our group just how to have individual courageous conversations with teachers. Many teachers in our group have, have talked about instances in which they've heard other staff members openly express racist ideas about students, about content that's being taught, about um, disciplinary structures and methods within the schools. And so I think it, it has to start with a small group um, who are able to, like Dr. Jeffries was just saying, be able to assess what that community is and, and where that community's at. 
how are we going to, we, we might have this, this smaller group of like-minded individuals, but how do we then push that out to the rest of our community? And I do think that that's going to be something that wanna, has to happen from a case by case basis in terms of what is that approach going to look like? But I do believe that there is, that there is work, legwork that needs to be done at the school level to get all of our, all of our teachers and all of our staff on board with this so that we can support these ideas from every angle, from every discipline. Um, and, and, and that's a, that's a tough, that's a tough task, but it's certainly a worthwhile task. And it's one um, that, that as we are endeavoring in this and in, in, uh, in my district, but specifically at my home school, we're, we're seeing positive results of being able to open up the table just for our small groups. So now we're just looking at methods and strategies for reaching that out to, to our, our fuller staff community. Yeah. Now, I, I would second that fully. I mean, you try to build consensus around these issues, that's, that's really important. Um, and it's hard, uh, it's definitely difficult. Uh, but you know, it's even harder to live with racism, right? So, so it's not like we have a choice. Uh, it really needs to be done. I think we have one more minute for another question. And it's, do you, um, I think, uh, I lost it. What are some resources you found to be most valuable in teaching and learning this hard history? Oh, 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 I'll just say quickly, uh, and Chris, feel free to chime in. I mean, you're right there too. Uh, primary sources are absolutely critical. Uh, and I mean, we don't have time to kind of go into, but on the, on the Teaching Hard History uh, website, there's a, you know, we have you know, literally um, you know, a couple hundred. We, we curated it some um, to pull out some really good stuff. But uh, for all of these 10 frameworks, we have, we have documentary uh, primary resource material. And that is absolutely essential. Uh, because not only is it sort of the voice of the people and people broadly defined, but what it does, particularly uh, when we're talking about slavery, institution of slavery, is that it humanizes the enslaved, right? And that's so critical. And, and this is, it, whether it's the Freedom on the Move, and I would encourage people to check that out, Freedom on the Move uh, database and archive on fugitive slaves and those who ran away. I mean, this is, this, we've been doing, I've been working with a group out of Cornell on that, which is an amazing sort of resource. And you can think of ways uh, to, to use that in the classroom. Again, the value of it, even though they're narrative, even though their advertisements written by enslavers, including Jefferson, um, they are, and we're talking about a database of uh, several uh, tens of thousands, um, but they still, are, there's still ways for us to, to use that to humanize the enslaved. And that's one thing that we don't do. And that's one thing that primary sources uh, can help us do that we absolutely need to do. Yeah, and I'm, I'll jump onto that question as well. Um, I know one, one thing that we struggle with a lot of times in the classroom is that we want to be able to go to uh, these primary sources and sometimes we'll even get, you know, we might go to a conference or a workshop where they talk about the necessity, the importance of, of looking at primary sources. But I know a lot of times, especially as you start getting down into the lower grades, but in the, in the, in the upper grades as well, the challenge of interpreting and understanding those primary sources, you know, something as simple as looking at the Declaration of Independence in fourth grade, that's tough language. I mean, that's tough language for even some college educated students to really grapple with and comprehend and understand and to set against the historical backdrop. So the kind of sources that I find myself looking for a lot um, are sources that help my students to be able to, to discuss and analyze and pick apart these primary sources. Um, one really invaluable resource that I've used a lot in the classroom has been through the Stanford History Education Group, and they have published two sets of curriculum uh, supplements, uh, both to help the teacher, but also they actually come with uh, sample lessons and some tools, and that's called Thinking Like a Historian and its partner Reading Like a Historian. These are two frameworks that I think have accompanying texts that come with them as well, but these were, these were two sets of frameworks and curriculums that allowed for me to have some tools that I could use in the classroom to help students actually examine primary sources. They have some example lessons so that you as a teacher can kind of familiarize yourself with that process. And I know that what that did for me was that just going through and using one of their example lessons in the classroom really opened up my framework for how can we have and facilitate these discussions. Um, so that's, that's been a really, really big one. Um, uh, in terms of looking for and searching for those primary sources, I know the Library of Virginia actually has a, a robust collection. Um, you can also visit the National Archives. They have a lot of those primary sources available as well. 
Um, in addition, here in Virginia, the Colonial Williamsburg uh, Teachers Institute has a wealth of, of resources that in the past, they only made available to people with a paid subscription. I think now they are offering those resources to educators for free. And I believe that their, um, their website is history.org. If you go to history.com, um, I think that'll take you to, to the, history, the History Channel's page, but <laughs> history.org should bring you to the Colonial Williamsburg's um, Institute where you can find a lot of those resources. They give a lot, tons of sample lessons all kinds of primary sources um, and they even have some some links to their their teachers institute resources as well that i believe that they have opened up and made available without any kind of paywall or anything like that um I, we are at 11 but dr jeffries and chris i did get one more question would you guys be willing to answer it yeah i can i, I have a i have a media call coming in but the phone hasn't rung yet so, so let, let, we could go for it. We could go for okay. it. Okay. I understand if you have to leave, if it comes through. Um, so the last question I just got asked was uh, from Megan Reimer. And she said that she's on a small team to write a new high school curriculum for Richmond Public School called Real Richmond. We are trying to tell the hard history of our city. What strategies do you suggest for promoting this type of course to other districts? And do you have any suggestions to keep in mind as they put the final touches on it? Yeah, no, I, I, and I'm familiar. I'm familiar actually with the with the with with that particular project. And I think critical is that you got to get the community engaged, and and you can decide, you know, at what point to get the community and, and community is broadly. It's not only parents, but it's also members of the community who are interested in this material. They are the biggest allies. Just as children, uh, your young people have created the space for these conversations, the parents are the ones uh, who create the investment. And so approaching them with this material, really, as I've seen in other places, getting that community support, getting the, the community uh, parental allies, really not only creates, creates additional space, but gets that buy-in so that this is more, so that what's created lasts more uh, than just one semester or even one year. Yeah, that was one thing that was actually discussed, I believe, in, in one of the podcast episodes where I believe one of the one of the guests or co-hosts um, discussed this this idea of going to the parent, go to your community, you know, reach out and, and get their input so that even if it's just to start setting the stage of how we can create a space to even have these kind of conversations. But I know, you know, in, in, in my past, when I was doing big projects in the classroom that I knew were going to touch specifically on issues about slavery or we're going to touch on issues about um, the, the legacies of uh, the, the atrocities committed against indigenous peoples in this country. I, I wrote letters home to my parents and said, listen, this is, this is content we're going to be getting into. Please, and I gave a space. I said, please email me if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, please write back any comments you might have about this kind of thing. And I think that what that did was it did, it made those, it made my community of learners feel, have a little bit more buy-in, like Dr. Jeffries just said. Um, even if there, even if not every single suggestion I, you know, I can immediately implement, or even if I get something that's really, really pushing back, this allows me to gauge what, how is my community going to receive this, what, and what uh, resources can my community offer to help me with implementing this. Um, so I, I second that and and add to it. Just really um, going going to that community is a really big step, and that's really that that word of mouth people having those experiences with those. Uh, with those curricular designs that you're making is going to be one of one of the most powerful tools because then they can, you know, they're going to be talking to other pa parents. They're going to talk to other parents. Oh, well, my kid's school, you know, they reached out to us about this big thing. What's your kid's school doing? What are they doing over in Fairfax County? What are they doing over in, uh, in, in Louisa, you know, in these various places? So um, that community buy-in is huge because it can offer the resources, but it also begins the process of setting the stage to open up that comfortable space to actually talk about these topics. Can I jump in really briefly? I know we're drawing to an end. I just wanted to build on what Chris was saying. Um, I do the same when I'm teaching tough topics to reach out to parents just to let them know what's going on and you know what we're going to be covering. And I found almost every time that I've done that, I have a parent that's got some sort of great connection to a facet of that topic that can either come in or speak or the parent is somehow involved. So I mean, I think that community involvement is really neat and that lets the kids see that their parents and that the friends of their parents uh, are involved in these topics too and can come in and be useful sources of information as well, which is sort of a neat connection. All right. 
thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Chris. And um, if you have any more questions, just kind of put them in the chat. And Emma is compiling a document with all the resources that people have been sharing. Um, I want to thank uh, Peter Headland uh, with Encyclopedia Virginia, which is a project of Virginia Humanities. And keep in mind, um, guys, that we are going to be mailing you um, with your certificate an actual binder, a physical binder, similar to we do when we do in-person institutes with a lot of these resources. Um, and we'll also put the digital um, links on the, um, the web page for the institute. And um, we are going to break for a few minutes and then we're gonna start back up again at 11.15. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.